The webinar is titled, uh, Using Connected Vehicle Technology to Deliver Timely Warnings to Pedestrians. Our presenters are Drs. Jody Plummer and Joe Kearney, and they are from the University of Iowa, and they mean the Hank Lab here at the university, which uh, studies pedestrians and bicyclists. And so I'll let them take it away. Great. Thank you, Don. Uh, I am going to start with a brief overview of the Hank Virtual Environments Lab just to give everybody an idea of the kinds of work that we do. So as uh, Dawn said, I'm Jody Plummer from the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences, and Joe Carney is from the Department of Computer Science. So we've had a longstanding interdisciplinary collaboration that brings together computer science and behavioral science to study uh, road crossing safety. So from the computer science side, we're interested in creating realistic, immersive virtual environments that allow full body movement. So our virtual environment can be configured either as a bicycling simulator or as a pedestrian simulator, which we'll show you in a little bit. And from the behavioral side, we're interested in using virtual environments as laboratories for studying human behavior. So for example, how do child cyclists cross roads with traffic or how do texting pedestrians cross roads? How do children and adults cross roads with peers? So this is a photograph of our bicycling simulator, and first thing you'll notice is that the angles look a little bit funny, but that's because the camera is further back. But if you have your head in the position of that child's head, everything looks like a continuous virtual environment. So the bicycling simulator we is instrumented, so we sense the steering angle of the uh, handlebars so that we can determine their trajectory. We also are sensing the speed of the rear wheel rotation, and that allows us to de determine how fast they're going through the environment. And so this is completely interactive, which means that if you begin to pedal, you'll appear to move through the environment. If you turn, you'll appear to turn through the environment. So it's a highly realistic kind of experience. So we've used the bicycling simulator to study many different problems. We've looked at how 12 and 14-year-olds and college-age adults cross one-way and two-way traffic. We've looked at how they cross high-density traffic. We've looked at how children versus adults intercept gaps on the run. We've studied how they ride bikes with a virtual peer, which you can see pictured in the lower left down there. Uh, we've also looked at how children with and without ADHD cross roads. So just to orient you to the kinds of measures that we use, there are two key things that we look at. One is gap selection, of course, so which size gaps do they accept and What's the likelihood of accepting a gap based on things like the gap size that they see or the child's age or things like that? Movement timing, we're very interested in timing of entry, and that is how the rider times his or her movement relative to the lead car in the gap. And so it's basically how closely do they cut in behind the lead vehicle in the gap. This turns out to be a very important measure in a lot of the work that we do where we see a lot of age differences and other kinds of uh, variables that make a difference in this. We also look at crossing time and we look at time to spare. So all of these things are related to each other in that the gap size allows a certain amount of time to cross and how much time to spare you have will depend on the gap that you choose as well as how tightly you time your entry and how quickly you cross the road. So here's just a graph showing a typical response curve of the proportion of gaps of different sizes that children and adults accept when they're crossing high density traffic. So these lines actually include 10 and 12 year olds and adults since they all act similarly in terms of how they're choosing gaps. So the green line curve you can see is the first four intersections that they bicycle through. And pretty much 
Nobody likes to accept the tight gaps between one and a half and, say, three or three and a half seconds. So the whole curve is shifted over to the right. They're a little bit more conservative when they start out. Our high density intersections are the blue, is the blue line, and you can see that that's shifted over to the left, which means that they're a lot less conservative when you push, put them in high density traffic. So what we found is that people do not like to wait, and so they will take much tighter gaps when they are presented with high density traffic than with sort of normal traffic. And then the red line is their last four intersections that they go through. And again, you can see that shifted over to the left relative to the first four intersections, which is showing that people get less conservative as they um, perform this task. So just a little bit about the main things that we have found. Uh, one of the things that we noticed right off the bat when we started this work is that children ages 10 and 12 tend to choose the same size traffic gaps as adults or our college age students. However, if we move down to the movement timing, we also found that children would end up having less time to spare when they actually cross the road than adults. And if we look back at what they're trying to do, what we find is that they delay initiation of movement in their entry into the roadway so they don't cut in as closely behind that lead vehicle as adults. And as a consequence, they have less, less time to spare than adults. We've also seen that uh, boys who are rated as higher in aggression by their parents will take tighter gaps. We find that if you're riding with a, virtu a risky virtual peer, you will take tighter gaps when you're later than riding alone as if you're a child. Um, and we also find that children with ADHD time their entry into the roadway less precisely than kids without ADHD. So now let me move on to talk a little bit about our pedestrian simulator. So this is a picture of someone in our pedestrian simulator. Again, the angles look funny because the camera isn't where the person's head is. This is a stereo virtual environment, which is why she's wearing those glasses. Those are um, shutter glasses. She's also wearing a helmet with little sensors so that the infrared camera the tracking system can pick up her location and render the graphics to uh, correspond to her movement as she's crossing the road. So one of the unique things about this pedestrian simulator is that people are physically crossing the virtual road. So they're not crossing on a treadmill or using a joystick or anything like that. They're actually physically crossing the road. And this is because our side screens are long enough that they can cross over a single lane of traffic, which is a nice feature of the simulator because it means that a lot of the same perceptual motor processes are going to be engaged as are in the real world. So our pedestrian studies have looked at questions such as how do children of different ages cross roads? How do people cross while texting with and without alerts, which Joe's going to talk about in a minute? We've looked at whether it makes a difference or not, whether you view the virtual environment in stereo. And we've also looked at joint road crossing, where two people are crossing together. Here's just another picture of a child pedestrian crossing a roadway in the virtual environment. And again, if you're the child there, the virtual environment, all the angles, angles are going to look correct to you. So here's just some preliminary data that we have of our child road crossing study. So we wanted to look at how children's road crossing changes over a fairly wide range of ages. So we had six-year-olds, eight, 10, 12-year-olds, and college-age adults. That uh, solid black line is the adults, which gives you a nice picture of how adults' uh, curve is very uh, systematic. They don't choose gaps that are tight, and they do choose gaps um, almost all the time if they're larger. You'll also see that the six and eight-year-olds 
have curves that are and slopes that are much flatter, which means that they're less discriminating in their gap choices, and you can especially see that down on the lower gaps, the two and a half, three second gaps, they're accepting those a lot more than the adults do. And then finally, the interesting thing to us is if you look at the 12 year olds, which is the line on the far right hand side, we see the 12 year olds being extra conservative and not accepting gaps of the same size that adults will accept. But it turns out that their timing of movement is still less mature than adults is, so they are timing their entry into the roadway less tightly than adults. But because they're choosing larger gaps, they end up with the same time to spare as adults have when crossing the road. So this suggests that there might be a transitional time when kids are actually realizing that they need to take bigger gaps to account for their poor movement timing ability. So that's a very quick overview of the bicycling and pedestrian work that we've done, and I am going to turn it over to Joe now, and he's going to start talking about our work on texting and providing alerts to texting uh, pedestrians. So hi, I'm Joe Carney. I'm in the Department of Computer Science and uh, co-direct the Hank Lab with Jody. Uh, there's been a lot of attention in recent years about uh, problems with driving with distraction, particularly while texting. And more recently, attention has been directed at the influence of pedestrian texting. Um, I did a, an informal study on my way over to the, to, to the building today um, over the lunch hour and just counted the number of students I saw texting walking around campus. And roughly one-third of the students walking down the sidewalks were texting. Um, there have been a collection of studies, observational studies, looking at texting and crossing intersections that show that particularly for uh, young pedestrians, there's an increasing prevalence of texting and road crossing. Uh, in addition, there have been experimental studies that have shown uh, how, how much it hampers road crossing, safe road crossing, by uh, texting. Um, there have been a, a number of efforts, uh, very public efforts, to bring attention to these dangers. So I, I have some on this slide in New Haven, Connecticut. And in New York, there were stencils that were put on the roadway to alert people to look up, uh, pay attention as they cross the road. Uh, there have been a couple of pranks that were done at the National Geographic building in Washington, D.C. Uh, the workers there made cell phone lanes so that uh, there, were, there were no cell phone in cell phone lanes to, uh, to, to, to point out uh, the, the, the interference they can cause with one another. Uh, and the uh, troupe uh, Improv Everywhere in New York did a prank where they had seen eye people that would uh, guide pedestrians that were texting down the sidewalk. Um, and then w recently in the Washington Post, there was an article about this last September uh, and talked about eyes down, minds elsewhere, dead walkers are, are among us. So clearly there's a attention to uh, the dangers of texting and walking. Um, there is an opportunity to, to uh, bring information to texting and non-texting pedestrians to give them assistance in, in um, road crossing. Um, this follows on work with vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication based on dedicated short-range communications technology that's being installed in vehicles that allow vehicles to communicate with one another to let them know where they are and how they're moving um, and uh, allow the, the drivers to be informed about potential collisions, and, and sometimes they ask, have the cars themselves react to a potential collision. Um, there's increasing interest in bringing pedestrians into this communication loop with so-called vehicle-to-pedestrian V2P technology um, that would allow cell phones uh, to have this short-range communication uh, chip in it so that they could know when vehicles are around them and how they're moving and when they are in danger. Uh, there's another variant on this that would uh, communicate between uh, pedestrians and instrumented roads or uh, traffic control devices, so-called V to I or, uh, or P to I, pedestrian to infrastructure communication. M most of the research that's been done looking at the V to P technology has focused on developing the communication technology, that is, um, providing the information to the phone. Um, interestingly, just last week I found out about a group at uh, Brooklyn Technical High School in Brooklyn, New York, 
um, that's developing uh, an app for a Samsung watch that uh, detects when cars are coming based on the, the sound of the approaching car and sends an alert to a pedestrian. Um, so our focus is on how can we provide most effectively the information to the pedestrian and how will the pedestrians respond to this information? How will it change their behavior? So we've looked at two different ways that this information could be, could be sent. One is to inform pedestrians when it's safe to cross, which we call permissive alerts. And the other is to look at information about when it's unsafe to cross, either a, a virtual don't walk signal um, or a collision warning when someone steps off uh, a curb into the road and there's an oncoming car. We call these prohibitive alerts. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about an experiment we did recently that uh, is going to be published in uh, IEEE VR in a couple of weeks, the uh, uh, virtual reality conference, um, on our Safer Sim project with permissive alerts. These are alerts that tell you when it's safe to cross, and so if you're texting, um, there'll be an icon on your uh, uh, text window. Um, you can see that 19 there, and that's a, a shot clock, a countdown clock, that's going to tell you when the next safe gap to arrive uh, will come to the intersection that you can cross. In addition, when the gap is just about to arrive, one second before the gap opens, there's both a visual and an auditory alert. Uh, that red um, icon there turns green, and there's a, a ding that goes on, on the phone and alert. So now what I'll do is, uh, before I talk about the outcomes, I'll show you some demonstrations. There were three conditions. There was a control condition, there was a texting condition, and a texting with alerts. So here you can see the pedestrian walking across the road. It looks a little blurry because this is a stereo image. This is an actual trial. So the images, there are, you're seeing actually two images there. The pedestrian only sees one. This is the texting condition. And in the next, you'll see the texting with a permissive alert. You won't hear it, but there, there is a ding. So here's the countdown clock in red. And shortly, there's the beep. You saw the beep, but you didn't hear it. Um, this is a, a short video of a, our visualizer. So one of the amazing things about simulation is you can replay simulation trials. So this is an animation that's replaying the trial which we just saw. And we can change the viewpoint. The sphere there represents the uh, pedestrian and where the pedestrian is looking. And the blue piece there represents the cell phone. We track both the cell phone and the person's gaze. Um, in the lower left, you can see as the animation moves along, that's a tracing of the motion, both of the vehicle and of the pedestrian. And I'll show you that again in a second on the on slide. So this allows us to do very fine-grained analysis to see where pedestrians are looking, how they're directing their attention, when they're moving, how they're picking gaps. So the, the uh, scenario was pretty challenging. Um, it's a curved road, so cars appear uh, from around a corner to the left. You can see up in the, in the top panel. Um, the gaps were relatively tight. The cars drove at either 25 or 35 miles an hour, and so the gaps are actually changing size as they approach the intersection. We control the motion of the vehicle so that we get a fixed regular size gap that they can pass through so that we time the gap that is available to them to cross through the intersection. Um, in, the, in the graph that you see there, on the top you see their gaze, so it shows over the course of a road crossing trial where they were looking, when text came in and when text went out. In the lower graph, is the blue shows the trajectory trajectory of the pedestrian. So you can see the pedestrian is kind of shuffling around there um, during seconds zero through up to about nine, and then passes through a gap in traffic and, and the blue line goes down. So that's the actual trajectory of the pedestrian walking through a gap. Um, the cars are illustrated by when they obstruct the path. 
So the first vehicle, V1, passed on the left side of, of that at about 4.4 uh, 4 seconds. That's when the front of the vehicle passed. The tail of the vehicle then is just after six seconds. And then after the second vehicle passed, um, the pedestrian passed between the second and the third vehicle. So one of the factors we look at, as Jody said earlier, is the size of the gaps that people take. Um, the three conditions are illustrated here, and you can see there's a difference between the control group, which is up at the, uh, in the, uh, let's see, control group is in the middle. The top group is the, uh, top curve is the uh, alert uh, group, and the, and the bottom is the texting. So the texting took smaller gaps. Um, the alert took about the same size gaps as the control and took a high prominence of the two uh, alerted gaps, the 4.0 and 4.5 second gaps. In fact, um, the, oops, let's see. So, yeah, 97% of the time, I think, they um, followed the uh, alerted gaps. They took the first alerted gap that, that came to them. So. Um, the good news on this is that people really zone in on the beep and the uh, alert and um, are highly likely to take the alerted gaps. Um, the, the bad news of this is that it reduces their attention to traffic. And so what we found is, is that people so relied on the beep that they rarely looked at traffic. So you can see on the three graphs on the right-hand side um, where they were looking. The orange is when they were looking at traffic. The purple is when they were looking at the phone, and the blue is when they were looking elsewhere. Usually they were looking ahead at where they were headed in the simulator. Um, and what you can see is, is that 97% of the time the control group looked at traffic, 46% of the time the texting group looked at traffic, and only 24% of the time did the alert group look at the traffic. Um, mostly what they did, if you look at the bottom curve there, mostly what they did is they looked at traffic after the beep went off, that one second beep that's at the green line there, um, they looked up from the phone and looked at traffic in order to check the gap and time their entry into the gap. Um, and one of the concerns is that um, the great amount that they, time that they spent looking at the phone reduces their overall situational awareness and potentially makes them vulnerable to uh, either mistakes or undetected vehicles or um, uh, just, it, I mean, it's sort of like the stories you hear with uh, people following Google Maps and uh, driving into a river because they're so zoned in on the, on the trajectory on Google Maps. Uh, and so there's some concern about um, how this affects their situational awareness and, and whether this is a good thing or not. Um, so overall, with the permissive alerts, what we found is, is that people gaze at the cell phone 76% of the time. Um, they gaze at the traffic just before they cross. There's a very high likelihood that they cross the identified gaps. Um, they have fewer close calls and hits compared to the texting only, and they have uh, time left to spare uh, comparable to the uh, control group. Um, I'd now like to tell you a little bit about some of our other work that we're doing with road crossing. This is, is looking at road crossing when multiple people are crossing together. So we're able to put two people in our simulator, and, and we can give them each their own independent view so that they get a prospectively correct rendering. Um, the way we do this is we give them a non-stereo view. And so one of the things we're, I'll talk about in a minute is what's the impact of stereo versus non-stereo. Um, but we've done studies looking at how two people cross roads together, um, go, going back to our neighborhood here. One of the motivations for this was observing pedestrians crossing um, a busy intersection that links uh, our campus to downtown. And one of the things you see is, is that people frequently cross in groups, and they do so in tight coordination in a group. That light has a shot clock on it that counts down in the walk cycle. And every time that counts down, there's some number of groups that have to make a go, no go decision about whether they're going to cross or not. And they do so usually without any verbal communication or gesture. They just, as a group, control their joint motion. And so we're interested in looking at how people control joint motion and how the influence of, of uh, two people 
um, changes the way they cross roads as, as compared to solo crossers. So here's a video of our experiment. So this is a pair crossing the same gap. And you can see the two different images. One is for one pedestrian and one is for the other. In this one, they're across a different gap, and you can see how much difference the geometry, uh, perspective geometry makes to the position of the person in the cave. So the first thing we did is we asked the question, does stereo make a difference or not for road crossing? Um, there's a lot of good reason to think that stereo probably isn't very important, and, and this is an uh, important result because so much of the research that's done in simulation is done with non-stereo rendering. So nearly every simulator in the world uh, displays images in non-stereo. Um, because the stereo cues are so strong in the near field, they fall off as the square of the distance. And they have an effective range of about one kilometer in the real world. In our, in our virtual environment, um, given that it's, the vision is less than perfect, stereo is effective out to about 44 meters. Um, so potentially, stereo could be important in judging gap size and in timing movements, um, particularly when the cars are passing through the volume and the objects are close to you. Uh, but there's a lot of natural experience. Uh, for example, we can, we can do a lot with one eye, and there, there are a lot of drivers who can drive without stereo vision. Um, and so there's, there's a lot to say that um, people can be pretty capable drivers without stereo. So this is the result. We did an experiment comparing non-stereo to stereo, and, and, and uh, the differences we found here were uh, non-significant. So armed with that, we did a, an experiment with joint road crossing where we had two people, each with independent non-stereo views, cross a road uh, in our simulator. What we found is, is that pairs were highly likely to cross together about 75% of the time. And when they did cross together, they very tightly synchronized their movements. They entered the road within about um, 0.19 seconds of one another. Um, pairs selected larger gaps than solo crossers and timed their crossing to accommodate joint crossing. And so the uh, person on the left lagged a little bit in order to allow the car to pass so the person on the right could cross. And they picked gaps that, that would uh, be appropriate um, and afford a crossing for, for two crossers. So here are the, uh, the curves for performance there. Um, and what you see on the left is uh, the difference between um, when they cross together for the uh, solo group and the uh, pairs. Um, and uh, we sort of lost the legend there, but the uh, solid is the solos and the uh, dotted is the pairs. Um, the uh, pairs picked more large gaps and fewer small gaps. Um, the other interesting finding we have is we looked at the uh, kinds of gaps they picked when they didn't cross together. Um, and almost inevitably what would happen is the, the one of the crossers would pick a small gap, um, and then the other crosser would hesitate and, and wait for another gap, and they would wait for a substantially larger gap. So you see the difference here between the uh, first cross and the second crossers as compared to the solo crossers on the right-hand side. So I'd like to take a moment to tell you about what we're going to do next. Um, we're, we're starting to look at uh, what the most effective ways are to communicate with texting pedestrians. So um, we're going to look at prohibitive warnings. These are warnings that tell you when you're making a bad choice at crossing. Um, one of the big difficulties there is trying to avoid large numbers of false alarms. It's um, pedestrians stand at the edge of the road and, and they're always uh, a second or so away from a collision. And so you, you have to make a decision very quickly. Um, and so we're looking at how quickly we can make that decision. And we're also very interested to see how people respond to these warnings. Will they back up? Will they speed up to cross the road? Uh, how will they respond to uh, getting the warning? Um, we're also interested in looking at um, crossing with virtual partners. 
The advantage of using a virtual partner is that we can program the behavior of the virtual partner, and we can look at how, say, different levels of riskiness influence pedestrian crossers. Um, we're also interested in how the qualities of the avatar, its appearance and its motion, influence um, the degree to which you, you treat it like another person. So I'll show you a video here of someone crossing with, this is our virtual avatar, Carl. And I'll show you that one more time. Um, and this is, is a, kind of just for fun. Um, there are two avatars here, uh, Carl and Carla. Um, and in this demonstration, Carl is programmed to take uh, small gaps. This is uh, what we call risky, risky Carl. And Carla is programmed to take larger gaps. And so you'll see here that the two of them cross the road at a different time. So you get a sense of what it looks like to have a virtual character in the simulator. The long-range goal of this work um, is to take our two simulators and have two people in two different simulators, um, each represented by an avatar in the other simulator. Um, this allows us to give stereo views to the, to the two people and also will provide us with a way to do studies of avatar fidelity and to better understand how people interact with avatars and how the properties of the avatars uh, influence that interaction. Uh, we think this is a, is, a, is a great medium for us to be able to understand better how people interact with char uh, virtual characters um, in, a, in a task that is a, a natural everyday task and it involves moving and interacting with another person. Oops, I skipped one. So um, this work is done in collaboration with a whole crew of very highly talented people. Um, this is a list of the people who have, uh, are currently in the lab or uh, have recently worked in the lab and made really important contributions to make all this happen. And lastly, we want to acknowledge our sponsors, um, including Safer Sim uh, and also uh, NIH, the National Science Foundation, who has funded the building of our simulators. Um, the Department of Transportation, and uh, the Injury Prevention Research at Iowa. So now um, we'd be happy to answer questions about any of this. Okay. Thank you very much. So while Alex is getting our participants unmuted, I have a question that goes back to the beginning of a, the presentation. Jody, you said um, that your simulators use full body motion, and I wonder if you a little bit about why that's important um, in, in, in what you look at. All guests have been unmuted. <laughs> well, so we've been interested in using these immersive large screen simulators because they do give you a view, like it's important for our road crossing work mm -hmm. that you have full peripheral vision. And so that's part of what allows us to look at road crossing because most driving simulators don't have as much uh, peripheral view there and so it's hard to look at road crossing. So that's partly why we use these large screen immersive environments. The full body movement is interesting, I think, more from a computer, well, it's interesting from a computer science perspective because a lot of the work that's done on, say, people, you know, interacting with someone in a virtual environment will be done more with just talking heads and not with interacting with full body 
motion. Mm -hmm. So, and then, I mean, I guess thirdly, in order to study road crossing, which involves full body motion, mm -hmm. we want to be able to replicate that in the virtual environment. Okay. So, this, do any of our attendees have any questions? I think you're um, unmuted, and so we'll try to speak up. Okay. I don't I don't hear anybody there. But um it's sort of a related question. You were looking at spirit crossings and people crossing together. And do you ever see a pedestrian try to cross in front of the, the, the virtual pier or take a gap if the virtual pier wasn't didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yes, actually we're just looking at that data just earlier today. <laughs> Um, and it's interesting because um, with the risky peer, it's, they treat the risky and safe peer differently. So with a risky peer, one that takes small gaps, they're much more likely to not take one of those small gaps and cross after the peer. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, um, so those that don't cross, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, it's about 80% I think mm -hmm. come after. With the safe peer, um, They'll get impatient because sometimes the safe peer has to wait a while till a large gap comes along. Right. And so they're much more likely to cross in front of the peer rather than, um, than wait for the peer. So when they choose not to cross, um, th those with the safe peer will cross before the peer. Those with the risky peer will cross after the peer. Okay. Um, the other interesting thing that we're discovering is, is that is it looks like people synchronize their motion to the crossing of the peer. It was, actually uh, par partly an accident that our um, peer starts more slowly than most of the people with a real partner did. Um, and what the, uh, the person who's walking with the peer tends to do is start out and then kind of slow down to allow the peer to catch up. Okay. So they, they almost automatically, it seems, synchronize their motion with the crossing of this virtual character. I'm going to open the floor again. Does anybody have a question they'd like to chime in with? Yes. Yeah. Yes? Go ahead. Um, I wonder how this might translate to two-way uh, two traffic. Uh, how this might translate to two-way traffic? Yeah, the, the crossing where you have to watch for traffic from both directions. Right, uh, right. Yeah, that's a great question. So. We actually looked at that with our bicycling simulator. And so we had people where they had to cross roads where there, was, there were two lanes of traffic and it was coming from opposing directions. So that's a very challenging kind of task because you have to divide your attention between both sides. And we presented them with relatively direct or uh, dense traffic, which made it even more challenging. So, in that situation, what you have to do is you have to pick a good gap in the near lane and you have to pick a good gap in the far lane, but more importantly, they also have to overlap with each other in such a way that you can cross the entire street. And so what we found is that people attempted to do this task by um, choosing what we call either rolling gaps where you could get into the near lane before the far lane gap opened and then you could go across, or aligned gaps where the far lane gap was already open um, at or at the same time as the near lane and then you can just shoot all the way across. And in that study, we found that 12 and 14 year olds were less likely than adults to prefer, well they preferred rolling gaps uh, less than adults did. Adults really like to, to cross with these rolling gaps. And, and we think that's because they're a little bit more challenging to time your movement, even though you actually end up with bigger margins of safety when you cross the road. So that study we published um, in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Human Perception and Performance a couple of years ago. We haven't been able to do this in the pedestrian simulator because our side screens are not long, long enough to have two lanes of traffic there. But we could do something like this with our head-mounted display with an Oculus Rift 
because you then can use whatever size room you need to cross two lanes of traffic. But it's definitely an interesting problem to study. Thank you. Any other questions or things that you didn't understand or wanted us to go back over? I have one more question um, about your avatars and about how people choose to move in those groups. Say you're in formal studies of students walking across the street. I know when I'm in a group of people and we're starting to walk across the street, it almost feels like the shift <coughs> is the center mass of the group, that we sort of all lean forward and start to move at the same time. So how, how do you, what do you think the avatars need to send the right cue and, and that kind of thing? Yes, that's a great question, and that, that's precisely why we wanted to use the avatars, because it allows us to control what it is that you see. And so we can experiment with different levels of fidelity and try to see, try to discern what the cues are. Um, uh, the, the, we, when you watch these trials, um, it's very hard to see what, what they're doing. They cross in their perfect synchrony. And, and it seems to be very subtle cues, maybe a lift of the heel, a tilt of the head, a little lean forward. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we don't actually know what it is that's allowing them to synchronize so tightly. Um, and uh, we're, if we're interested in, in, in studying that more. Um, you know, there's, a, there's another phenomenon, which is um, the follow the leader sort of phenomena. So um, there have been studies that have looked at um, when a group is standing at an intersection and one person crosses a red light, what's the likelihood another person well, um, and, and mostly they, they uh, report that it increases the likelihood that somebody else will go if one person goes. So there does seem to be some sort of gravity that, that people carry around with them yeah. <laughs> that uh, pulls other people along. And as you were speaking, the, the concept of somebody who's interacting with their phone, whether it's texting or not, do they feel that shift in, in peers? It's sort of a combination of everything you talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but I can imagine if it's not a visual cue, it's something else, like the spatial cues around them, perhaps even distracted people, so is a herd thing, if, if it was the text one. I don't know. I wonder if they left behind or what. Yeah, and we haven't put together two people in cell phones yet, so um, that's part of the fun of this. There seem to be an enormous number of possible things to look at. We haven't looked at elderly. We'd love to look at elderly. Um, we're talking about looking at various groups with mobility problems and how they cross the roads um, and how m maybe assistive technologies would help them make decisions and cross roads. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to turn it over to our guests one more time to see if there are any questions. Okay. Is there anything that's come up that either of you would like to just remind us about or or tell us about before you take, before we end? Okay. Well, I, you know, I guess the one thing, uh, um, we're really interested in hearing about work that others are doing um, and always open to ideas and suggestions for others. So if things occur to you, if, if you see something, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you're ever in Iowa City, come by and we'll give you a demo. We'd love to show off. Um, and uh, and we'd love to know what you're doing. Um, it's uh, it's always interesting to hear what others care about and what they're doing too. Okay. And how can they get in contact with you? Um, email. Is email the is the best. Okay. Yeah. And so um, yeah. they can like it's Joe Carney at uiowa.edu. Yeah, we have that on the first slide. I don't think. Okay. So it, yeah, so it's Joe Dash Carney K E A R N E Y at U I O W A dot Edu. Yeah, and mine's the same, except it's Jody, J O D I E hyphen Plummer, P L U M E R T at U dot Edu. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being brave enough to do our first week webinar with us. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we are going to sign off now. Great. Thank you. Thanks.